going to sneeze. Or not. Hi, everybody. Augie Kennedy here with Super Awesome Calculus. And today, we're going to start Chapter 2, which we call Take It to the Limit. Why not? This corresponds with Chapter Number 2, Limits and Derivatives, in James Stewart's Calculus Early Transcendentals, 6th edition. Um, if you skipped uh, chapter one, you just missed a review on functions, basically things that you may have learned in pre-calculus, and, uh, and we learned about various different types of functions, how to analyze some of them, and it was essentially a review. This chapter introduces the first real ideas of calculus, and that is the notion of a limit. And now, we're going to get started with section 2.1 which is about the tangent and velocity problem. Now the tangent and velocity problem have been around for a really, really long time. Uh, actually, it's the foundation of Zeno's paradox, which you may have heard about at some point, um, about a guy, well, we'll go over Zeno's paradox in better detail later. Now for the facts. Um, basically, we need to figure out what a limit is. If you remember the function, the reciprocal function, f of x equals 1 over x, you'll notice that right here, for instance, it looks as though this function, if you make a higher number, 1, 2, 3, 4, you'll remember that the higher the number, this line is going to get closer and closer and closer to zero. It's called an asymptote, but it's never actually going to reach zero. So while it would be actually incorrect to say that the limit of this function is zero, it would be correct to say that if you just look at this little area right here, from here to infinity, that it is indeed getting closer and closer and closer to zero. You can make x as big as you want, and the bigger you make it, it's going to be that much closer to zero, but it's never actually going to be zero. Now that's kind of the idea of a limit. Now what we're going to do first is we're going to look at something called the tangent problem. Now as you probably remember, a tangent line is a line that touches a curve at exactly one point. So for instance, let's take a circle, about to embarrass myself here, yeah, woof, woof, let's take this circle here, and let's look at this point. Now I don't know or care what that point is, but the tangent line to that point should only touch the circle at exactly that point. So the tangent line would be like that. So that's the tangent line. Now if we're trying to find out, what, what, if we, what if we're looking at something like this though? What if we're looking at a parabola? Okay? We're looking at this parabola right here. And we're looking at this point. Now we know what the slope of a line is, okay? You remember the equation for a line, y equals mx plus b. We know that m is the slope. We don't really know what the slope of a parabola is. There's, there's no way for us to figure that out. So, what we do know though, is we know the, line, the slope of a line. So let's look at this parabola. We don't know what the slope is yet. You'll find out what it is soon enough. And let's look at that point. Well, we don't know what the slope of the parabola at that point is, but what we can do is we can draw a tangent line, and we can figure out what the slope of that tangent line is. Now, one way that the book uses to illustrate this point is pretty interesting. It uses the secant line. Now, if you remember, the secant line is going to touch it, it's going to make a chord, it's going to touch it at two points, like that secant line. So let's make this parabola here bigger. I'm going to erase this 
and make the parabola bigger so that I can better illustrate what it is we're doing. I'm going to be focusing mostly on the first quadrant. In fact, basically entirely. I'm sorry that that's it. In fact, I have to do better than that. That's just too hideous for words. That's still pretty bad, but God. Okay. All right. Fair enough. No, it's too much of a line. This is embarrassing. Okay. There we go. I don't care at this point. So here's our point. Right there. Here's our tangent line. Whoops. Oh, oh, gross. Okay. Tangent line. And we're going to call this point X. So we have the tangent line right there. Now a secant line, though, is going to be, since we can't figure out quite what the derivative is yet, we can look at two points. We can look at this point, P, and this point, Q. So here's P on the parabola, and here's Q on the parabola. And if we go together, we can connect them with the secant line that chord right there. So the secant line, as we can see, isn't quite the same as the tangent line, but we can do something about that. We can move Q closer to point X, and we can move P closer to point X. So let's move P1, Q2, or Q, Q1, yeah. There's Q and there's Q1, why not? So Q1 would be here, P1 would be here, and we can see that the secant line is a little bit more like the slope of the tangent line. And as you might expect, and if you did expect this, you'd be right, if you make P and Q close, small, the, dis the distance smaller and smaller, closer and closer, you will eventually arrive at a point where P and Q are right next to X, and that the slope of the secant line is basically the same as the tangent line. And that's the, that's the idea of how you would do this. You take two points on the parabola, say, if you want to figure out what the slope of a parabola at X equals 3 is, you could take, okay, X equals 1 and X equals 5. And you can plug in and figure out what the slope of the secant line is, and then try it again at x equals 2 and x equals 4. And then if you really want, x equals 2 and a half, x equals 3 and a half. And you can get as close as you want to 3, and you can figure out what the slope of a line touching that point would be. Now, why would you want to know this? Well, it's useful to know at what rate functions are changing. And if you know the, the uh, tangent line to the curve, you'll know something called the derivative, which is something that, in fact, that is what the derivative is. And that's something that we're going to be examining almost completely. That's, that's the foundation of this part of calculus. So that's the tangent problem. Now we're going to look at the velocity problem. And for the velocity problem, I'm going to use the book's example. All right. This is pretty good. So the book's example is, if a ball is dropped from the top floor of the CN Tower, if you're Canadian or if you're from New York, the Empire State Building, um, you want to find the velocity of the ball after five seconds. Now, what do we know? Well, here's what we know. We've got a building, a big building. Actually, let me make this, let me make this a little bit more CN Tower-ish, if I can. Okay. Something like this. Kind of like the space needle type thing. I don't know. That's probably way off. Okay, what we know is that this building right here is 450 meters 
high. And what we know is that we're standing right here at the top, and we're going to drop a ball all the way to the ground. Okay? Now, we can figure out we can figure out what the distance fallen is. We know this. Galileo did this. Um, S t equals 4.9 t squared. That is the distance of a ball draw or any object in a vacuum. It's not a vacuum, but forget about air resistance for now. That's the uh, distance that a ball will fall after a given amount of time. Okay? Now, the problem is, is that we need to figure out a velocity at one point. We're not looking for the distance, we're looking for one singular instantaneous velocity. Now we can, we remember the average velocity equation. This is pretty, uh, pretty basic. This is change in position over change in time. Okay, this is, this is very simple. Uh, another way to put this, I'm sorry, I just smudged it, would be y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. If you, if you look at that, you'll, you'll realize that that's very much like the uh, equation for a slope. Now what we want to do is we want to find the velocity, the instantaneous velocity at, I'm just going to draw a point, 5 seconds. Okay? So the way that we need to do this, if we remember change in position, uh, minus, and then the change in time, is we look at the position. Okay, well... This is our position, s of t equals 4.9t squared. So we're going to use s of 5 equals, um, let me just make sure. Oh, yeah, this, is, this isn't going to work too well. Basically, the point is, is that if we have the, uh, the time the time change, we can't have just one time because there's no time elapsed. And if we make the time elapsed one point or zero, we're going to be dividing by zero. And we can't divide by zero. That's bad. It never ends well. So we're going to pick an interval. Just like we kind of did with the parabola, you know, when we picked a point P and a point Q and went closer and closer. We want to figure out what it is at five seconds. Okay. Well, let's figure out what it is between S6 or S of, I'm using this directly, so why not? They're not going to use that. They're going to use S5.1 minus S5 over the time differential there, which is 0.1. And we're going to look down. And we're going to see that that's basically just 4.9 times 5.1 squared minus 4.9 times 5 squared over 0.1, 0, which is going to be 49.49 meters per second. So you see we took 5.1 and we took 5, and we just made a little in interval difference there. Now it turns out that we can take larger and smaller chunks of this, and you can plot it out as a table. If you remember, in chapter 1 we talked about different ways to represent a function. Here's a table, way to, a tabular way to analyze this function. This is the time interval, very important. This is the interval. And this is the velocity, average velocity. 
So the time between 5 and 6, average velocity is 53.9 meters per second. Between 5 and 5.1, well, we already figured that out. That's 49.49 meters per second. Between 5 and 5.05, is 49.25. Between 5 and 5.01, we have 49.049. And finally, between 5 and 5.001, we have 49.0049. So you can see that basically what, we're, what we have here at 5 seconds it is going somewhere, we know that it's at between 5 and 6, higher than 5, around 5 and a half. It was going 53.9 uh, meters per second. Between the interval of 5 and 5.1, it was going 49.49. A smaller interval, 49.25. And then an even smaller interval, 49.049. And then between 5 seconds flat, and 5.001 seconds, a thousandth of a second, it was going 49.0049. We can look at this and we can figure out that this number is going closer and closer and closer to 49. And we'd be right. It turns out that the instantaneous velocity after 5 seconds is 49 meters per second. So that's basically how you would solve a velocity problem, at least at this stage. So you can see what the, uh, the math that's required in this section is basically exhaustion. We, we take two numbers and we just keep going and keep making the difference smaller and smaller and smaller until we can glean some kind of pattern. I would recommend you go enough numbers in to get a pattern uh, to be sure of your pattern. Um, please note that it won't be like this forever. There is a much easier way to do problems like these, um, and we'll be learning that very soon. Next time, we're going to be learning more about this idea of a limit, but first, I have a problem for you to try out that's based on what we learned today, and you can try it on your own. Here's the question. If a ball is thrown into the air with a velocity of 40 feet per second, its height in feet t seconds later is given by y equals 40t minus 16t squared. Part A. Find the average velocity for the time period beginning when t equals 2 and lasting half a second, a tenth of a second, 5.05 uh, seconds, and 0 0.01, a hundredth of a second. Five hundredths is three? Yeah, five hundredth of a second and one hundredth of a second. Estimate the instantaneous velocity when t equals 2. So basically what I'd recommend with this problem, if you want a little hint, is to just approach it exactly the way that we just approached this problem um, with the ball dropping off the CN Tower. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you next time and take care.